I'm with you. Hello, Peter. Can you hear me? I can. Yes. Yeah, so yes. are you? Yes. Great pleasure to have you on. Yeah. Nice. It's nice to see you. Yeah, yeah, finally, great. finally meet. Yes. But, uh, yeah. So we'll just start with what got you into the martial arts way back. Yeah, that was uh, that was 1964, and uh, so I was 15, and I'd uh, I'd actually got my dad to take me to a fencing club, and I was there for like a couple of weeks, and all they had me doing was a foil, was was prodding a wall, you know, the tiles with yeah, the holes yeah. in them. So I hit the same hole all the time, and I thought, I'm 15, so I. I thought we'd just be slashing around with a saber after two weeks. So, so, and then literally about a week after I said, I'm, that's not for me. There was an adverse in the Manchester evening news, which was something like learn to kill a friend with one blow. So I thought that's for me. That looks Went fun. down. It was, um, karate club run by, um, Danny Connor and Martin Stott, which was in Manchester back streets of Manchester, 1964. Uh, the club was called the Seder Camp Clubs, and some of the Seder Camp Clubs are still going now, Emma. Yeah. So uh, it, was, it was when I first started, it was sort of Wado, but then became very traditional Wado, as we had the Japanese over Suzuki, Shimitsu, Kamazawa, all those. So for them, five years, um, yeah, Wado, for uh, that, that early period. So that was yeah. the early, oh, mid-60s, Emma. You went on then to uh, fight full contact? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, so so the transition from, so traditional Wado, so from probably 65, 66, I was then on the Great Britain and England squads, so from the 60s. Um, But then in 69, most of the northern Seder Camp clubs that were with the British Karate Association had a split from the south. We'd split from the Japanese. We broke from the south um, and we then changed to Shukakai under uh, Kimura and Sensitani. And that was, a, that was a burning bush moment for me because that was all the dynamics, the double hit, kick shot, other, other dynamic elements that hadn't been in, in what I've been doing. Yeah. And it changed everything that I was doing at that time. Um, so that took us up to the 70s. And then it was in the mid 70s that I first fought the full contact side of things. Yeah. And that was the very early. And to, and to be fair, that those early days was full contact karate. Not yeah. full contact, it was not. So full contact karate. Mm-hmm. We were wearing the Junri shin guards and gloves. Yeah. Um, but before that, from sort of 70-ish, I'd been working the doors in Manchester. And from 71 to 79, I uh, was about eight years on one door in Manchester. So I'd got that practical side of things that was going on in one box. I got traditional still going on. I've got the full contact. And I was also doing um, Chinese stuff like the Wing Chun because Danny Connor, who had been my original instructor in the Wado, in about 65 or 66 had gone off to the Far East, started in Japan, ended up in China, came back with all the Wing Chun connections, all the Tai Chi. So, and for me working the doors then, that Wing Chun gave me that distance that I didn't feel I'd got with the traditional karate, if you like. Yeah. Um, Being used to that, competitive distance in karate not you know um, if you look at Kyokushinkai full contact it happens a much closer distance than to say WKF you know the tip you're on type thing yeah um, so the Wing Chun gave me that that distance that very close thing that was working really well practically yeah um, so that was all that mixing everything some boxing the karate the Wing Chun uh, but but I've always operated on um, what, what I call the box principle. You might have heard it, which is I've got this big box, which has got everything in it. Um, and what I don't do is throw anything out of that by saying that's not practical or that yeah. won't work there. It's not meant yeah. to. You're meant to enjoy it in the big box, whatever it is, traditional, anything you want to do. But when it comes to a specific, 
and that might be full contact competition, tip your own, it might be working a door, it might be general street defence. You can't take that big box. You have to take elements out of it and put it in the box. Yeah. And I think that's what a lot of traditional karate people, traditional martial artists never figure out. Yeah. They think the whole thing is going to work and it, and it won't do. Yeah. Eastern martial arts work against Eastern, Eastern martial arts. Not yeah. some piss that stroke yeah. on a bar on a Friday night in West Yorkshire, where I am. So, yeah. yeah. So, uh, modern times with full contact with emergence of MMA and Kuro, what's your opinion on them? I'm not a fan, really. A fan. Um, mm. You know, I appreciate it's got better. I appreciate oh. the toughness. I appreciate the mental resolve, the aggression. Um, and we've got people now with inherent foundational skills coming into it. You know, you've got people who've done long-term karate coming into the MMA, as we now know. But when you looked in the early days, it was, for, for me, very, very few of the people then had actually practiced a foundational martial art to a really high standard. Yeah. They got a bit of this, bit of that, bit of the other. Emphasis probably more on grappling because of all the time on the ground that's not limited time wise. So um, it lacks some of the qualitative elements I look for in martial arts, but not taking anything away from them, you know, tough as nails, great yeah. resolve, great aggression. But the ground and pound for me, you know, I, if, if there was any ground, I'd just go and make a coffee and have a sandwich while it was all going on. <laughs> you know, I get yeah. nothing from it at all, you know. Whereas you compare that with something like Kudo where is it 20 seconds on the ground and they're up again you know yeah. they're putting people down taking people down demonstrating the hits but you know back up again and off we go all the combat jujits the combat sambo again same thing limited yeah. time of on the ground it's great great they're great competitive systems for me yeah you said about um the transition from doing the com competitive fighting and to the door work yeah i know you even don became a bodyguard after that as well yeah. Was there a major difference in the mindset between working the doors and working close protection? Yeah, there's no, there's no link, in fact. Yeah. Um, you know, I know, I work with people who've got no martial arts experience. Um, some of them are civilians and no martial arts experience and no military or police experience. But phenomenal guys to work with mm. because it's not about that. You know, if, if, if yeah. it all came on top, yeah, you'd like somebody who would still be standing on either side of you. Yeah. Even if you weren't that competent in doing, you know, it's the, they would still be there. But it's more they've got that ability to plan, the diligence, the attention to detail, you know, the appreciation of, of how you deal with clients. Because all my, the vast majority of my close protection work is executive protection, which was working with uh, owners of businesses, international businesses, you know, so for example, not speaking out of term, but you know, looked after members of the Mars family, the Wrigley family, the chairman of the New York Stock Exchange, you know, the chief executive uh, computer associate. So it's all been at that level, um, yeah. which is executive protection. So most of that work is planning, it's logistics, it's getting people in good order to places on time. That's the challenge, really. Um, yeah. We're not fighting, we're not doing that with a knife between our teeth. Emma and the, you know, yeah. so, um, Do you think it's important in uh, self-protection courses nowadays to add some of that on the situational awareness, the sort of um, yeah ecology of fear, I suppose too. Yeah. Well, yeah, you've got that, 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 sure, you, you can't take that away. Um, one of the problems with, with the uh, self-defense courses I see, it's a lot of it is martial arts in genes. First of all, so you've got people who do martial arts who take that big box and say, oh, well, now we're going to do self-defense out of that box. Fucking bollocks. You know, you yeah. cannot take that. And, and other, and other self-defense courses, you look at them and they're teaching fighting. Yeah. Well, self-protection is about stopping something before it becomes a fight. Because a fight, a fight's essentially, you, you're in a casino. You're just playing odds. Yeah. You can trip over a curve, somebody gets on. So if you're fighting in that confrontational situation, you've done something wrong. I spent many years teaching police forces here in the UK, uh, police service in Northern Ireland a couple of times, 
uh, taught at national police training and all I was teaching was preemptive strikes and impact development. Yeah. That's what they got me in for. Preemptive strikes, this is the police force, and impact development. Not martial arts or fighting skills, although of course my um, elements that I do for preemption have come from the martial arts, but put into that, that context. So fighting skills aren't self-defense skills. They're a support system if it goes tits up when you're doing what you should be doing, which is tactical intervention, stopping something before it turns into a fight. And that's where people miss it out. Now, clearly, the other element, which is like uh, handling fear responses, which is the chemical reactions, you know, the physiological and psychological response to the immediate severe threat. Yeah, you've got to handle that. You've got to introduce that into it for sure. But yeah. you've got to separate fighting skills and intervention, preemptive strikes. You know. Yeah. You mentioned your book, Streetwise, uh, the excellent book, by the way. Um, Okay. about uh, Jeff Cooper's colour codes yeah and uh, could you explain what they are and their application and self-protection for the general civilian yeah sure yeah. It, it, in, if, if you look at in streetwise and anything that I write about I, I do Cooper's colour codes alongside my threat per, pyramid uh, yeah. uh, I don't separate the two people yeah. get Cooper's colour codes wrong they think they are like an awareness thing and they're not cooper's color codes are a trigger and it's a color trigger to move you to a different state so cooper's cooper developed the color codes as a response many 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 years ago and i think it was the american state department had their guys looking after embassies and uh, they might have a car draw up at an embassy in south america mm. so they'd, they'd be a little bit you know alert to something that's going to happen all of a sudden four guys get out so now they get hold of their weapon let's say it's a pistol they've got um the guys start walking towards the thing so they draw it should i draw it should i not draw it get a bit closer they start should i point it or not point it so they're making these decisions and then all of a sudden they've got rounds coming in and they've been taken out and what cooper said you have to move away from decision making at times of stress so what you have to have is a trigger that moves you to the next stage and those were the colour codes. What the colour codes don't do, though, is keep you switched on. Yeah. So my pyramid is my threat pyramid, which at the top of it is fight or flight. So what we have to do if we get in a situation is one of two things. Be prepared to fight or be prepared in enough time to flight. Yeah. But if you work that down the pyramid, what you've had to have, have had below that is the identification of a threat. That you have you have assessed a threat in enough time to be prepared to fight or flight but to a assess a threat you've got to have been switched on and aware that you took the information in to process it to identify things as a threat and then you you're ready so you my triangle is bottom is awareness moves to i'm aware i'm switched on i take all the information in i get that and assess what i'm saying I, oh i don't like that i'll i'll cross over the road, I'll turn round, I'll go in and shop. And if I can't, then I'm prepared in enough time not to be taken by surprise. But, but the problem still is, is moving from those levels to a click a switch and now I'm not making a decision. So I put Cooper's colour codes alongside my pyramid. Yeah. So Cooper talks about condition white, which is switched off, which perfectly aligns with, with my awareness pyramid and then we've got condition yellow which is permanently switched on condition orange click on to assessment and then condition red fight or bang that's it yeah. he had condition black which was the application of deadly force that was how he had it now what i teach people to do and i've been teaching say execs in russia and we take them out walking i get them to use cooper's color codes as a bit of a traffic light yeah. So I'm teaching them to stay permanently switched on, which is a different thing. But then decision making, I'm trying to stop them at times they might be getting stress of making decisions so that they use the color codes to switch them to do things without trying to decide to do it. That's where the two work together. Emma. Yeah, excellent, excellent. So um, the final question, um, where do you see martial arts going in the next 10 years? And do you think technology will play a big role in it? And 
But anyway, yeah. will that take away from the traditional way of teaching yeah. the hands-on? Yeah, technology in what sense then, Emma? Just so it's in context. Um, with rise of YouTube and things like that, a lot of people are instructing online now. Do yeah. you think that takes away from um, the hands-on approach yeah, to things? Yeah. No, no, sure. That's, um, yeah, you've got a couple of things, really. You've got what people see on YouTube and emulate. Um, I, one, of, one of my problems has been people think that because I talk about practical issues that I'm dissing traditional systems and I'm not at all. Yeah. What I'm saying is, you know, that big box has traditional systems in it. Enjoy it, even if it's something that is absolutely not practical. But uh, my big thing about it is find, a, find an art to do that you become really good at. That's your foundation. Doesn't matter what it is, whether it's Tai Chi, whether it's karate, judo, jiu-jitsu, whatever. A good system that becomes your foundation, that you own, that, that is you. And then you can add on all the other things you think have a value or you like doing. My problem is these days, there's that much people can dip in and dip out of, never good at one thing. Yeah. And what they what and when I get people who come up and train with me sometimes with my group, what I see is people are trying to put things together and it's a Frankenstein monster. You know, yeah. it's got an arm sticking out the back in here, you know, it's got an arm, a leg sticking out with backside. You know, it's not put yeah. together. So people haven't got that foundation on which they can sensibly think this won't fit, this will fit. Like like Wing Chun. I love Wing Chun, but we do adaptive Wing Chun. We just take the bits out of it that fit, not the bits that won't fit with our sort of global system that we do, if you yeah. like. Um, and of course, yeah, and, it, and it's, it, it speaks to a societal change, not just as it affects martial arts, Emma, but how yeah. social media is affecting everything. Yeah, definitely. Waters not. down standards, allows people to have a comment on something that they just want to be negative on irrespective of not knowing sod all about the topic as we know yeah. so yeah yeah well that's excellent it was excellent having you on peter thanks very much great emma and well nice to see you hopefully yeah. we can chat again soon yeah and uh, take care in the meantime uh, good luck bye for now bye yeah. now